Gabe Hamill, buddy. Hey, it's great to see you, man. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, dude. Uh, really appreciate you being here. I know I'm going to see you in about a week and a half, hopefully uh, traversing the Grand Canyon with me. Um, this is your first time meeting Chris, my business partner. So I've told him a lot of good things about you. Um, but what I would like us to do, because you do have a really, really unique story that I don't know all of it. Um, you know, and I know you've been on Bigger Pockets a few times and other podcasts as well. But would you mind giving us kind of a, a brief overview of your, your getting started and kind of your, your real estate investing uh, journey? Yeah, absolutely. You cool. guys are free to ask me whatever you want. So um, I guess kind of going back before even get involved in real estate, going back to even like my childhood, I was I was kind of the kid that had a hard time paying attention in school, uh, just real fidgety, really like, like couldn't even at a young age, I was like, how, how are what they're teaching me in class? Like, how does that relate to the real world? Like, I, I just remember trying to connect those dots. Like I, I had great parents, but they worked lower paying jobs. And I remember like most adults were always like, Oh, thank God it's Friday. They couldn't wait till the weekend. And I'm like, there's gotta be more, more to life than this. And also at a young age, like I wanted some level of my own financial independence. So you know, I was the kid that went out and got a paper out at 12 years old and I was selling candy bars out of my locker in middle school, uh, condoms out of my locker in high school. <laughs> and I, I was like there, you know, there, there's gotta be more, but like what they taught in school, like back then I would have said, I didn't like education or I didn't like learning, but it really wasn't until I found things that I enjoyed learning about that I realized I actually did enjoy learning. So I don't know that I would have actually even stayed in high school if it wasn't for uh, high school wrestling and the social aspect of school that that's, you know, those two things definitely kept me there. And then I ended up joining the military in high school. So at 17 years old, uh, I joined the army national guard. I joined an infantry unit. I had a, a friend saying, just like the commercial, right? One week in a month, two weeks a year, you go play, you know, GI Joe in the woods, they pay for your college, which I never really went to. Um, and I thought, you know, why not? The recruiter would come pick us up at lunch in a Humvee, take a shooting. I mean, it was, it, it made sense. But so I joined in uh, 99 and I graduated high school in 2000 and around, gosh, I, a bunch of odd and end jobs. I had one term at a community college, but around 2002, I read the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And I used to be embarrassed to say it was the first book I ever read in my life, but it truly was the first book uh, that I ever read in my life, word for word, cover to cover. So I got all the way through school without ever reading the book, but that book changed my life. Not so much because it's a how to book, but more just the mindset of around there's something other than like go to school, go to more school, get a job and, and work forever. And so it actually answered a lot of questions that I didn't even know I had. And so I read that book in 2002 and I was like, I like, that makes sense. I'm going to be financially free. I'm going to do it through real estate. And my mind was completely made up uh, after reading that book. Dude, that's wild. Uh, we just had Grant Frankie, um, who's also part of the 50. And all three of us were sharing our rich dad, poor dad moments of reading that book and the the absolute change that it made on our lives. Like for me, it was uh, uh, 2017, read it halfway through it. I, I, I stood up, you know, it was like 10 o'clock at night and just put my head against the wall of like, why the hell has nobody ever told me this before? Just, I, I always was under the assumption that I either had to be incredibly intelligent, invent some sort of app, um, inherit money, or just trade my time for dollars. That, 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 that I did not know there was something else. Yeah, I, I was very similar in that set. I was like, gosh, I know I don't wanna work for somebody else and definitely not forever. And I kind of always had the entrepreneurial bug, but I didn't, I also thought, oh, that must mean I need to like invent something, right? Like I need to come up with some crazy idea. But then I'm like, God, real estate just fucking makes sense. Like buy assets that put money in your pocket. Like that, that's a no brainer. Yeah. Um, when you were going to school, were you, uh, since you hadn't read a book to that, that's impressive dude, especially knowing where you are now um, until rich dad, poor dad. And I, I also know you spent a lot of time on self-education and self betterment. Uh, how were your grades in school? You know, I, I, I graduated with like a 3.0, but it, um, part of that was because my senior year, you had to have five classes to participate in sport. So I had a, a teacher helper, uh, two weightlifting classes. I had ping pong, um, 
half a year. English. So I, I was able to get a four point my senior year because of uh, those classes. So it actually, that raised me up to a three point. So my, my average before that was like two, you know, two something. Um, cool. You know, and what's interesting about like the, the not reading the book thing is I didn't find out till years later that I had some dyslexia. Uh, my youngest son has dyslexia and you know, I like audiobooks changed my life. Audiobooks and podcasts changed my life because I can retain the information if I get it in audible. And I was actually listening to an audiobook about dyslexia to learn about my, my son who's now 14. And I'm listening to this audiobook about dyslexia going, Oh shit. Like that makes sense. Like that was, that was my childhood, right? I just found ways to, to get through and get by. But now that I can listen to audiobooks, I mean, I'm list, I can listen to things on two X speed and I can retain that completely where I'm reading a page of a, of a physical book and my mind's got a hundred different thoughts and I have no idea what I just read. Yeah, no, that's a, uh, that's interesting. Cause my, uh, my oldest son is very fidgety. You know, he, he can remember anything like we're at football. He knows where every single player goes on which play all that. But you know, you, you throw some multiple choice questions at him that have the different things. And he's like, man, I'm out like th yep. This is not for me. So it's uh it, it's good to hear that. So, all right. You're like 19 years old at the time, right? 1999 or so. Um, yeah. So I, I read that book in 02. So I was like 19 years old. Yeah. 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 What, what's, uh, what's the next step for you? Yeah. Well then it got a little interesting. So I, I had a bunch of odd and end jobs. I'm living in my friend's attic for a hundred dollars a month. And again, my mindset is like, I'm going to go buy some real estate. Well now, you know, and I, odd and end jobs and trying to figure out like, how do I, how do I get into real estate? And then in 2003, I got a phone call and five days later I was deployed. So I go from living in a friend's attic for a hundred dollars a month with this idea in my mind, like I'm going to build this real estate empire. I don't know how, um, but I'm going to. And then all of a sudden on a Friday night, I get a phone call. We have to come in on Saturday. We have to come in on Sunday. We have Monday and Tuesday to take care of any of our personal, uh, items, say goodbye to our families. And by Wednesday we're deployed. So I spent most of 2003 and four, uh, 14 month deployment in Kuwait and Iraq. And so really my mindset over there, and I hadn't bought any real estate prior to that. So my mindset, you know, on the deployment was come back alive. Don't come back too messed up and come back and buy some, buy some real estate. I didn't know how I just knew that it was possible. And so that was really my mindset. Come back, buy some real estate. So I come back in 2004 and I just start looking at properties. And this is right during the sub, you know, right during the subprime. And I'm talking to lenders and they're like, you're approved for a loan, even though I had no job and no income, no down payment. They're like, you're approved. So I bought my first house in 2005 and it was pretty, it was pretty easy. It was like a friend of the realtor's son. It was a hot, it was a pretty hot market. And I was getting beat out, uh, you know, on all these offers with cash prices and multiple offers, but ended up finding something off market. Uh, you know, it was a friend of the realtor's son. And I was like, this is pretty easy. I house hacked that first home, rented out two of the bedrooms, uh, did, did the very similar thing in 06 and very similar in 07. So by 2007, I have three properties and I had moved from one to the other to the other. And, you know, it's a little bit of cash flow, 300 bucks a month from this one, a couple hundred dollars a month from this one. Um, and I'm like, I don't know how to scale this. Like I need, like, I, I have some assets. This is what, you know, Rich, this is what Robert Kiyosaki's talking about. And it's putting a little bit of, uh, a little bit of money in my pocket. So my initial goal then I was like, gosh, this is so easy. How do people not just go to the bank every year and buy another house? Initially, I was like, I'm just going to go to the bank every year. And in 20 years, I'll have 20, 20 homes. And so uh, I had also I had also opened up a nutrition store in 2006 that by 2008 really wasn't making a lot of money. It always made money, but some months like literally a couple hundred dollars and that wasn't enough to, to live on. So by 2008, I had the three houses. I shut the nutrition store down and my first child was born. And that was kind of the moment of like, all right, well, what do I do? What do I do now? Uh, so, you know, I go to the bank and I say, I want to buy another property. And they said, you're not approved. And I said, what do you mean? I'm not approved. They said, we don't have a job. You don't have an income. You don't have down payment. And I thought, well, I never needed that before. Why do I need it now? <laughs> and, and they said, well, there's this thing and you know, the loans are bad and yeah, you just don't qualify. And you know, you, you should probably go get a job, go get educated, you know, save some money. And, and I thought, gosh, I'm not qualified for anything. You know, I, I, I come back from the deployment. I open up this little nutrition store. I start buying a couple properties, but I don't really have any qualifications. And so in 2008, 
I just started taking a bunch of odd and jobs, like literally like 12 bucks an hour. Craig's Craigslist help wanted ads. I'm like landscaping. I'm doing, uh, like phone call stuff, like any, any little odd and job I could get. And eventually I landed a 30 hour a week minimum wage job in a high school special education class. And, uh, I mean, the short story is three months into that job, I start thinking about my goals and I'm like, this, this is not the life I want. I do not want to be working a low paying job for the rest of my life. I need to replace this income and I need to do it fast. And so, you know, my take home from that job was, you know, barely over $1,500 a month. And so that seemed like a very obtainable goal it was like, if I can just replace this income, I'll at least have my time to go put more deals together. And at, at, in those days I kept my expenses really low. So I would come home from work and at night I would just get on Craigslist every single night and I would start just searching for, you know, seller, seller financing deals for sale by owner, everything off market that I could find. I mean, I was kind of doing it all. I was calling every listed property too. Uh, you know, at the time I wasn't comfortable asking a hard money lender for a loan. I don't think I would have even qualified for that. I didn't know anyone with money. So private money wasn't an option. I just thought seller financing would be my route. And after about a year of looking and hundreds of phone calls and hundreds of conversations and analyzing hundreds of deals, I found two duplexes side by side that cash flowed almost to the dollar I was making at that low paying job. And I finished out that year of work. I replaced my income and I never worked a, you know, a, an actual job again. So I, I actually became financially free very young and fast but my income was really low. I'm like $1,500 a month cash flow positive. And I'm like, I'm financially free. <laughs> I did it. I'm retired. And like my friends, like, what the hell are you talking about? You're retired. And, and, and then I had to reflect and be like, yeah, $1,500 a month is, is only going to go so far. This is not the lifestyle I want. Um, but you know, I, I spent the rest of 2009 through 13, just buying small multifamily properties with no money down seller financing. That's how I built up my initial portfolio was all no money down seller financing of small multi, like two to eight unit type stuff. My only criteria was they had to be cash flow positive because that was my income. I needed the the cash flow. I wasn't focused on appreciation. I wasn't focused on um you know, just like I wasn't doing fix and flip type stuff. I wasn't doing big, big projects. I was buying tenanted properties and made sure the financing that I got penciled today when I bought them because I needed that cash flow to live on. Yeah. So that, that, that seller financing model, was this fully financed by the owner or were you also getting bank debt on top of that? It was 100% financed, a hundred percent financed from the sellers. Okay. That's did the best. Yeah. Did all these sellers have their properties paid off or sometimes where they still have their notes and you were just kind of on top of it? Providing yeah, income it's a good to- question. Um, in from 09 to 13, they, they, <coughs> they were all free and clear. It was all um, mom and pop owners, uh, amazing people. Uh, it was usually men and women in their 60s, 70s, sometimes even early 80s, but usually 60s and 70s who had owned the asset a long time, and they had they they owned them free and clear, but they'd also self managed, and they were just good people that were burnt out. They were you know poorly managed, under rented, some deferred maintenance, and really just tired landlords. And so you know, I was going in and finding these properties and, and to me, it just fit like poorly managed, under rented, deferred maintenance gave me an opportunity to actualize that upside and to get rents up to market. But also it created an opportunity for the seller to be a lot more passive. They got true mailbox money. They became the bank and I'm making my mortgage payments directly to them. That's awesome. Were you self-managing all these or what, 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 would, what did that look like? I self-managed up until 17 units. And at 17 units, um, it was 10 o'clock at night and I have young kids at home and, and I'm not that handy, right? Like, and, and thankfully I'm not, I watch people who are actually like good in construction, have a harder time turning things over. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. They want to go fix everything. They're like, ah, I can do it. Let me grab my tool bag. I'm going to replace the toilet. And they're there all day heading to Lowe's Menards nonstop back and forth. Uh, Oh, a hundred percent. I, I have a, a friend. He's actually the, the first guy I ever partnered with and he's very handy and he knows like, so for him, it's a lot harder. Cause he's like, I can do it for so much less. And I'm like, yeah, you could, but this is also going to take up your entire day. Right. And yeah. so like time became very valuable to me, but also I felt fortunate that I wasn't very handy. So at, at 17 units, I, it was like 10 o'clock at night and I'm trying to like fix this toilet and my knuckles are bleeding and I just want to be home with my family. And I had to call a plumber anyway. And that was the moment that I'm like, you know what, it's time to turn everything over to property management. And I did. And what it allowed me to do, like that was the first year I put something 
10 units in a, 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 and bigger, uh, under contract and purchased. It was, I was good at building relationships and putting deals together. I wasn't great at property management. I didn't enjoy property management. I, I enjoyed putting deals together. And so you know, the year that I turned everything over to property management was also a year that I, you know, started to scale in a different way because I had the time and energy to, to go put more deals together. Yeah. So at, at this point, um, were you, uh, were you moving any of your seller financing to bank debt, to refinance, to recapitalize, or were you still sitting under the mindset of just continue to stack on that cash flow to support living and, you know, probably some for savings, et cetera. Or what, what did that look like? Yeah, that's a good question. So in 2014, I refinanced all my seller financing properties into long-term fixed debt with the bank. And that was a big aha moment for me at the time, because I remember in 2008, I didn't qualify for a loan. Mm -hmm. And then 09 through 13, I put these deals together. And so I had, I think, I think I refinanced 10 of those 10 of those loans in 2014, I didn't pull any cash out, but these were hundred percent finance. But by 2014, the market, you know, the market was up, rents were up, interest rates were down. And so I was able to refi every one of these properties that praise at 70% LTV or better. And I remember thinking like I closed on all 10 of these, uh, refis at a time. And I remember, th- and, and all in the low 4%, 4% interest fixed 30 year fixed. And I'm thinking, this is crazy. I ended up with the same type of loans that I would have had to put 30% down on. That's amazing. For, there's it's this phantom equity that can't, I mean, part of it was uh, the market conditions. Part of it was the rents were up, um, but they all appraised out. And I ended up with these loans that I would have had to put hundreds of thousands of dollars on it down on. And now I locked them in and I realized it was a lot easier to refinance properties that I already own than to buy properties. And so I, I just kept focusing on seller financing, uh, from 2014 forward. And then I started using private money and, uh, some hard money. And I've really never traditionally financed a property actually ever, except for my last two, uh, or I guess my last few purchases have been a combination of some seller financing and some, some bank debt. Um, but up until recently, it's all been seller financing, private money, hard money. Wow. Wait, wait, what's the, sorry, go ahead, Chris. Oh, I'm just like, curious. How, I mean, how are you finding these deals? You direct a, direct a seller or how are you finding these deals? Cause oftentimes it's tough to get through those, navigate that, I guess. Yeah. Er, everything, everything I've ever purchased has come from a conversation and relationship. 100%. I've never, never spent any money on marketing. I've never sent out mailers. I don't do any kind of, you know, ringless voicemail or auto text. I, none of that kind of stuff. It's, it's a hundred percent been organic networking and being willing to open my mouth and tell people what I'm looking for. And I think some of that I feel like is genuinely just like law of attraction. Like you, you think about it, you put it out there in the world, but then you take action on that. So like an example would be when I turn those properties over to property management and then I'm like, okay, I, I was dead set. Like I need to buy 10 units or above. 10 units or above. Well, I couldn't just sit on my ass and, and be like, all right, 10 units and above, and I'm going to manifest this and it's just going to show up. I still went out and looked at properties, but of course I was looking at properties 10 units or above. So in December of that year, I ended up in contract and purchasing an 11 unit apartment complex. Full so seller finance. Should, what? Full seller finance. Seller finance. Yep. It's yep. Unreal. Seller finance. And so, uh, you know, it's like in, in, in that situation, I, I think, you know, it was part mindset, but then I also, took action on that. I stopped looking at the, at the time, what I thought was smaller properties. Um, but my focus was 10 units or above. So where did I end up with 10 units or above later years when I shifted to the mobile home park space, it was, that was my focus, mobile home park. So what, you know, what did I attract? What were the conversations about? It was around mobile home parks. What did I purchase? You know, mobile home park. So, uh, and then, you know, the, the financing piece, uh, also interesting, kind of go back to that 2014, when I refinanced those properties, one of the sellers that I had paid off, you know, she had a big lump sum of cash because she had financed a couple of those properties for me. And she said, what am I going to do with all this money? Now we had a great relationship. I had made payments to her on time every month for six years. In fact, I used to hand deliver that check to her back in the day just to have that FaceTime and build that relationship. So in 2014, when I refined and she said, what am I going to do with all this money? I just casually said, you could lend it back to me. And she laughed, but then two months later, I'm in contract on a property and I was going to get a hard money loan. She happened to call me that week and said, Hey, were you serious about borrowing that money? 
And I said, yeah, I, I am. I'm actually in contract on a house, which was in the same neighborhood. She's like, can I finance that for you? And I said, sure. And she became my first private money lender. And it's, I didn't have to talk her into it. I didn't have to convince her. We already had a relationship and we already had the experience and the track record of me making payments to her on time. And so kind of there forward, it's been a combination of part private money, part seller financing. Uh, you know, of course some cash out refis where I redeploy the money into, um, other properties, but to cross my whole portfolio, I'm really no real money out of pocket because of how I started right now. I've deployed capital. And I've done 1031 money and, and, and such, but because of starting with these no money down seller finance deals in some ways, it's like, it's all house money at, yeah. at this point. Yeah. W- were you, uh, I mean, I, uh- pretty sure I know the definition, but I, I always, I don't laugh at it, but uh, the difference between private and hard money. Yeah. I think, <clears throat> I think of private money as <clears throat> like a direct relationship you're borrowing from typically uh, a person. Now I think when people think hard money, cause one of my hard money lenders calls himself a private money lender because they are, they don't actually have a fund. They have investor funds that they're taking and they're, then they're lending out private money. But usually when I'm referring to private money, it's private money is a direct relationship with someone that's lending you money on a deal and hard money would be a, a, an institution or a private money lender. Sometimes it's a fund or like a lending fund. Other times they are using private, private yeah. money from other investors. And w- wouldn't you also say that typically private money is considered cheaper? It, private money for sure considered cheaper and a lot more flexible. So I have great relationship with my hard money lenders, but they're also, you know, they're also like, well, these, these are the terms. There's a little bit of negotiation room because, uh, I've, I've been a good borrower and we've built that relationship with my private money loans. There's a lot of flexibility. I, I've had private money loans that are hundred percent unsecured, meaning they're not attached to a property. There's no lien. I've been able to renegotiate, um, interest rates down. Like I, I had one private money loan for 250,000 and I tried to pay her off. I think I was like at 8% and she's like, I don't want to be paid off. What if I gave you another 250 and I lowered the interest rate to 5%? (laughs) Yes. Yes. deal. Now that was a benefit, a huge benefit to me, but it was also a benefit to her because she didn't want that money returned. She wanted to deploy money and she was fine having a lower interest rate. So yeah, I would say private money, a lot more flexible terms, typically a lower interest rate. Uh, but I think they're both fast money. I think it's important to have, you know, access to both. I, yeah. I use a, I, I, I say, so we have a private lending company, hard money lending. Business. I don't say hard money lending only because it's somewhat viewed as derogatory. It's like same day paycheck, same day loan paycheck stuff. I actually agree with you, but when I explain one of our businesses, I, I explain it as private money lending only because I feel for whatever reason, unless you're in the space, like we are hard money lending sounds to be like a same day, like a predatory loan or something. And I don't like to use that phrase. That's true. And it hard money sounds, and it makes it sound hard, but hard money is pretty easy. Yeah. 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 It, it's a, it's a contradicting term. What I've been using lately is we're an asset based lender. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, r- really at the end of the day, if, if you have assets, we'll, we'll lend as long as we can secure those. What I think is really interesting because so many times people are like, I'm looking for a private lender. They post on Facebook. They say, do you know any private lenders? Well, yeah, I do for me. Yeah, no. Like, <laughs> yeah, like it, it's a person that trusts me with their money. Like that, that's why it's a, a private, you know, it's an individual that's going to entrust that other individual. So I think there's a massive gap um, that people have to overcome. And you are like the literal example in every single one of your things of like, you don't need to spend the money on marketing. You don't need to do these different things. You need to build genuine relationships. You need to take interest in people. You need to care. You need to understand what what you want and you need to speak your truth of what you want to those individuals and put yourself in those situations. Um, but to, to get private money or to develop these relationships, you have to have a relationship and a track record because nobody is out there randomly that has, you know, their life savings of $500,000 that they're gonna give to some random person on one of their first flips or even their third flip at a 6% interest rate. It's not gonna happen. They're gonna do it to a person that they feel incredibly comfortable with. Otherwise, you're going to the 
private, private, hard money lending route where it's more of a business transaction where you're you're posting liens, you have different sets of terms and the flexibility isn't there because that lender needs to be protected based on the lack of relationship. So I, I think that's the, the, the way in which you formulated your entire career. And I, I know you've done a lot more, um, even more so recently, but of creating those relationships, cultivating actually caring and giving a damn um, about what the individual is looking for, um, but also being true to yourself of what you're looking for. Um, I mean, you're, you're not trying to fit a square peg in a round hole. You, you are literally trying to, you know, mesh, you know, one person's needs as well as your needs together. So I, I, it's few people, if ever, have explained it like, like you have on how you've created your real estate business. Um, and I think this goes with almost, I mean, this can go for any relationship. Like what you're talking about is how you should find your life partner and friends, like develop real relationships. You're doing it in the business sense in this scenario. So uh, once again, kudos, but I think it's just something that everybody's looking for the quick fix and not I mean, it took you how many years to get your first deal? Hundreds of phone calls of persistence of, of getting out there. Now, do you have to make that many phone calls to get a deal? Not, not at all. Right. Yeah. And, that, and that's the thing like that, that snowballs. And, and I think, you know, you find what works for you and your personality. Like I do think like relationships, like I enjoy people. I enjoy conversations. I enjoy, you know, building those relationships. You meet someone, I don't go into it thinking like I'm trying to get something out of them. Like, I, I don't care if we, maybe we're going to be acquaintances. Maybe we're going to be really close friends. Maybe we'll never see each other again. Maybe we'll do business together. It, and in a, and I just, I don't, I don't care. And I mean that in like a, in a sincere way, like if we do business together, great. If we're just friends, like that's, that's cool too. Right. Um, and I think, you know, for some people that's, that's very natural. I, I know people that have found all their deals through wholesalers, like that works for them, or they found all their deals, you know, through, through mailers and you, you kind of find what works for you. And I say, double down, triple, triple down on that, you know, and you know, one thing that you, that you said that rings so true specifically to seller financing is, you know, you said something about, you find, find what the seller's looking for. And then if you can create that solution for them, create that win-win, uh, that's all seller financing is. I think a lot of people think that you're trying to convince or educate or sell a seller on why they should carry financing. In fact, the question I get asked most is how do you convince a seller into carrying financing? And the question I get asked the second most is what are typical seller finance terms? And what's interesting is I have never bought a property with seller financing where I am talking the seller into carrying financing a hundred percent of the deals and, and not saying that you couldn't cause you could educate a seller on all the benefits of it. You know, here's all the interest you're going to earn over the years. And you know, you get the mailbox money and you're not paying capital gains all at once. You could educate a seller, but every seller who's ever carried financing for me, they've already wanted to, they already understood the advantages. And then it was just me listening to find out what is it that they want? What is it that's most important to them? And can I give them that thing that's most important to them and still make the deal work for me? And that's where that like win-win piece comes. That's where that relationship piece comes because people want to do business with people they know, like, and trust. And if they know, like, and trust you and you're solving their problem or you're giving them that one thing they want, like maybe they're stuck on price. You give them the price they want, but they give you, you know, a no money or low money down you know, seller finance term with low interest rate, or maybe they're stuck on interest rate, but they're flexible on, on price and down payment. You know, it's, it's, it's really finding that true win-win where everybody walks away happy. I never, I, I never feel like I walked away winning and the seller walked away losing. Yeah, no, that that's great. And I, I mean, I was saying this in the last podcast, but I had a guy that we were negotiating with an agent was involved and my conversation went very similar. I was like, you, you know, I, I'm just happy to be on the phone with you. This is my price, you know, however we can close quickly. And at the end of the day, and I said it almost exactly like you of just, you know, I don't care how this goes, like, and not in a negative way, like, it's fine. Like, I'm okay if this doesn't come to a transaction. This isn't something that I'm really worked up on. And, you know, but I am going to explain my point. And I want to hear your point as well of why you feel these things and see if we can come to a mutual agreement. But if we can't, dude, I want the best of luck for you. Like, I want you to get what you want and what you deserve. And I'm just telling you, these are my points of view, but I really need to know your points of view as well on this transaction to see if this can work. 
and it, and it works. I mean, every time, I mean, not every time, but every time you walk away with a positive conversation, I should at least say, you may get a transaction, you may not, you may develop a friend, you may develop somebody that can help you or that you can help them in certain situations or solutions. And I mean, the more you do those things, your, your omnipresence and your just uh, your overall network and relationship ability continues to grow when you focus on those relationships of just listening providing as much value as you can and not looking for a sale or a quick transaction. I mean, it's just, you know, there, there's so many different angles of everything. Um, and if you're just looking at things binary, it's, you're going to have a lot of trouble or you're going to overpay and you're going to be put into basically the regular bucket. You're going to be finding, you know, on the market, retail deals, putting 25% down. If you're only looking for a, you know, one-to-one -one transaction. 100% agree. What are you doing now? Yeah. So I've kind of shifted, like, you know, I, I, I like to say I micro focus a little bit. I, you know, some people like to stick to a certain asset class and, um, I've jumped around in the sense of like, I think all asset classes are great asset classes. I think there's opportunity in every asset class with, within real estate. I don't syndicate deals. I don't, I don't raise capital. And so, you know, I, I understand why people specialize, you know, if, if they're raising capital you and you're taking money from someone or you're giving someone money, you kind of want them to be an expert in that, in that asset class. Um, you know, that being said, I still have about 450 residential units. Um, most of those I own hundred percent myself. Some of those, I have some, uh, partnerships, 50, 50 or, uh, one third type stuff. Uh, and that's a mix between multifamily and mobile home park, uh, uh, spaces. So in 2019, I was really looking for, better return. And I felt like the multifamily space was really the returns, the cap rates were really, really being condensed down to, to nothing. And at the time I was still investing just in the Pacific Northwest. And so I started looking into the mobile home park space. I was originally looking, uh, throughout the whole country, but I ended up buying a lot of stuff, uh, kind of in my backyard in the, in the Northwest. So I bought my first mobile home park in 2019, I own eight mobile home parks today and then one RV park campground. Um, and those have, those have served me really well. Um, again, it was kind of that same model of poorly managed, under rented, maybe some deferred maintenance. I like the mobile home park space because you can force a lot of uh, appreciation without spending a lot of money. So like that first park I bought for 1.3, two years later it appraised out at 2775. And some of that was... Uh, cap rate contention. Some of that was uh, the park hadn't had rents raised in four and a half years. Utilities weren't being billed back, right? So I was able to add 30,000 to the NOI by a small rent increase, which was still below market at the time. You know, I didn't, I didn't want to price out my tenants. Um, so I was very conscious of that, but my property manager sent out a notice for a small rent increase six months later, utility bill back. They were still below market, but they added 30,000 to the NOI without spending a single dollar. And so I like that in the mobile home park space. I, I want to own none of the actual homes. Most of my parks, I uh, don't own the homes or if I do own the homes, I sell them back to the tenants or to somebody else as quickly as I can. Um, and then as of late, my last several purchases have been large triple net industrial properties uh, out of state. And I like that space a lot. You know, it's, it's, it's a wide range. I have tenants that are paying $500 a month space rent. And I have a tenant in one of my commercial properties that, you know, that tenant does 5.7 billion a year in revenue. Right. And so it's, it's a, it's a very extreme, uh, sides of, uh, the tenant base and they both serve a great purpose and they're both great, both great tenants. And so, I, I like the lower income mobile home park space and I like having large, uh, industrious tenants in my industrial properties as well. Um, for the mobile home parks, what are some of the key attributes that you're looking for? So you don't want to own the homes or you're selling them really quickly. Well, septic location, size of the, the pad, what kind of, what, what are, what are some of the, the criteria or things that you want to put in to your underwriting or just your overall due diligence that's either a go, no go, or it's a go, but. Yeah, my, all my parks are 30 <laughs> to 50 or so, 30 to 50 units. Um, I prefer city utilities. The parks that don't have city utilities, 
they've had the biggest challenges as far as like septic or yeah, some of the sewer stuff. Um, that being said, there's, there's still fine parks. I want mostly tenant owned homes. Uh, you know, that, that brings the expense ratio down so low. My best parks, two of my parks have no, uh, park owned homes. Those are the easiest, the easiest parks because the tenant owns a home. There's a little bit more pride of ownership. They're taking care of all the expenses, uh, maintenance and all that kind of things. Um, but I'm okay with a few, a few park owned homes. I'll, I'll have my property managers try to sell those back to the tenants. As far as due diligence, you know, there's a lot of, uh, I, I don't put any value on the park owned homes when I'm underwriting a mobile home park deal. A lot of the brokers will, they'll show all this rent coming yeah. in, but then what you have to factor <clears throat> in, you're like, well, these are all park owned homes. The rents, the rents are great. The numbers look good, but they're basing their cap rate. They're basing their performa off of, um, like nothing ever going wrong. And they may be getting more, uh, more rent, but their expenses are going to be a lot more over, over time too. And that's going to eat up a lot of the, a lot of the cash flow. Yeah. Isn't it? I was just thinking through this. I mean, it's it, not, not saying it's to that point, but it's probably pretty close to where you almost want to give the actual physical home away based on homes away. Yeah, I absolutely. Yeah. I was just thinking about that. I'm like, okay, so knowing the quality of the homes and kind of the construction, the things that can go wrong, the, the, the low rent that you're already getting for these, you have a couple issues. Somebody moves out, you're fixing them. I mean, what can you sell one for 15 grand? It might, might just be easier to get rid of it. I, I have, I have given a few homes away. I, I have a great property manager too, where, you know, you don't want to just give it away to someone that's going to basically squat for, in it for and sure. Then and then you got to clean it up. Yeah. Yep. Yep. But we've, you know, I've, I've definitely given homes away and, you know, underwriting these mobile home parks, like that first park, there was an old home. I put no value on it. The first park it sold for 42,000 cash. Right. And so that's kind of nice. I put no value and it sold. And now there's someone that lives in it. They have pride of ownership. You know, other homes I've sold for 6,000, 12,000, 18,000, uh, not purposely multiples of six, but, um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's every price range, but it's two tenants that my property manager, uh, still approves, make sure that they can, uh, live in the park, but also someone that could fix up, could fix up the home, not just someone that's going to, you know, keep it a, a junk home and have it be an eyesore to the park. Yeah. Are you buying these large industrial triple net deals still on seller financing? I'm not. So, um, my, my first industrial deal, uh, was park, ba part bank financing, part seller financing. Um, that was five, five properties in Indiana. Uh, five locations, 140,000 square feet between the five locations, strong tenant. Uh, my second industrial deal was in Iowa city. And that was also, that was actually part, uh, bank financing, part broker financing. And that may be broker maybe financing. Most, yeah. Mo it might be the most creative, um, deal that I've done to date. I always thought, you know, like seller financing, like, Oh, you're seller financing guy, creative financing guy. And I was so anti-bank. I'm like, oh, I'm only going to use bank for refinances. But I found that if the deal's good, banks are actually willing to get creative. So mm -hmm. I'll I'll share what I did with the Iowa City deal because I I think it's I think it's a cool deal and it's a it's a 34,000 square foot uh, square foot uh, industrial building in Iowa City and the tenants. One tenant is the oldest construction company in Iowa city. They actually built the property in the nineties. And then the other tenant is the largest labeling packaging manufacturer in the world. And what's interesting is during my due diligence, the one tenant, they built that they'd been there for years. They had signed a new five year lease. The other tenant, the labeling packaging manufacturer, they have 300 locations across the country. And after the a corporate, has them sign a 10 year lease at any location, but after their 10 year lease, they don't typically sign more than a one year lease. And so I saw that as a little bit of a risk because they're paying above market rent to have basically the option to only sign one year leases. And I thought, well, how do I mitigate that risk? I was able to negotiate a $350,000 rent guarantee at closing. And so that rent guarantee came from uh, the tenant so that if they were to vacate, that would cover some of the rent. Or if I were to sign a uh, longer lease with a new tenant in the future, that money would be, would be released to me. But it actually, it actually got a lot better. So I bought this for 2.9 million. 
it was going to be 80% bank financed. The broker was going to carry 10%. The broker, the, yeah, the, 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 the broker real estate carry. broker. So that, that, that's what I wanted right. to get it. Okay. Keep, keep going. This is great. <laughs> the broker was going to carry 10%. And he wasn't, he didn't own the deal. She, yep, she, no, she, she didn't own she didn't own the deal. She did get it under contract and basically was flipping the contract to me, which is fine. Okay. Um, so 80% bank financed, 10% broker finance. That money came in as down payment assistance. Mm -hmm. So it's 90% LTV. But here's the interesting thing. 2.9 million. I was going to bring about 300,000 to the table to close. So about 10% down. Well, I had a $350,000 rent guarantee at closing. Normally that would be escrowed. But the cash flow on this property was good enough that the bank said, we don't need that escrow. We don't need that money escrowed. And we actually don't need all of it. We'll give you 150 K back at closing. So let's go through that again. 2.9 million purchase. I bring in 300,000 down, which is 10% down. They hand me a check at closing for 150. So now I'm into this only 5% down and first year cash flow on this thing is like 108,000. So it's like, I think it's like 60% cash on cash return. Year Not on. bad. Not bad. Well, Corporate wasn't letting this tenant sign more than one year leases. Well, the bank still, they gave me that 150 back. There was still 200,000 that would typically be escrowed, but the bank said, we don't need that escrowed. Why don't you deposit that into one of our accounts? We want deposits. You can put in a savings, a checking or a CD. So that 200 went into a CD, earned interest, not a ton of interest, but it was earning like four and a half percent while I was sitting there in a CD. And they said, we'll release this back to you if the, if the tenant signs another five year, if they sign a five year lease and I had a great, you know, I, I, I built a great relationship with the bank and I'm like, they're not going to sign a five year lease. Like corporate doesn't allow them to, but their best client is Procter and Gamble. It's like a mile and a half from the property. They're probably not going anywhere. Well, when the second year rolled around, they ended up, they ended up signing a two year lease. Cause it's like their favorite location of all their locations. And that 200 K was released back to me. So I'm into that deal, no money out of pocket. And that included a rent increase. And so in that deal, you know, it was just an example of the bank willing to be creative. And I think I had a fixed mindset prior to that, that creative meant it had to be seller financing. And here was a bank and a broker and all these people that were willing to get creative because, <clears throat> because the deal was good enough. That's awesome. I have never heard of the broker side. That's the first. Well, that's they, awesome. they basically, yeah. Cause they got a wholesale fee basically. So yeah. that's yeah. awesome. Yeah, no, that, that is awesome. Um, and everybody, <clears throat> and everybody won. So like I had a good relationship For sure. with that broker. We worked together initially on that very first industrial, um, uh, portfolio that I purchased. And then she had a great relationship with the bank that financed this Iowa property for me. Right. And so I was able, able to leverage her relationship with that bank. She brought the deal to the bank and the bank said, gosh, you brought us, I don't know how many deals they've, they've worked together on, but we like your buyer. We like his balance sheet. We like the property. We like the location, we like the asset class. And so not only did I have a good relationship with the broker, the broker had a great relationship with the bank and kind of put it all together. So the bank was happy. The broker was happy. I was happy. Like everybody, everybody won in that scenario. Was that a local bank to Iowa city that you used? It, yeah, it was localish. It was a, yeah, it was a, a, a local bank. Great. Cool. Yeah. We, th we love local banks. I'm going to, I'm going to switch gears a little bit. Um, and it's because it's one of the, something that I'm really interested to hear about from you because I kind of follow follow your lifestyle. How many hours a week do you typically work? And, and you probably know where I'm leading with this of just kind of how you structure your life now. Uh, I, I try to usually a couple hours a week. Yeah. Yeah. Is that, is that true? Like, like really a couple hours? That is true. Uh, you know, I think like if it's, if I have more going on at the most, it's maybe a couple hours a day. And that I'm just like, Oh my gosh, I had to do stuff for a couple hours a day, but usually like actually anything working on the business on investing, it's usually a couple hours a week. Yep. Does, cool. th does this hour count as work? I don't know if I, I mean, I'm not like writing this down, like uh, this hour of <laughs> yeah. podcast. Well, cause you have your own podcast, right? I do. So you yep. count that as work? No. Okay. An hour, that's a, That's an hour a week. That's a fine line with the whole work definition. Cause like, I just, I sincerely love what I'm doing and I feel like I'm working all the time. I, it'd be hard to differentiate between what work is and what's just stuff I love doing. I, yeah, I think it's like, I, and I think that's an important piece of it. Like 
I get to do what I enjoy doing, right? Like I enjoy, I enjoy doing the podcast and I, you know, I do the podcast with a couple other people and we have a team. So I get to just show up and ask people about real estate, just like this, right? Like if I was having to do everything else, that wouldn't feel light to me and I wouldn't enjoy it. And so, yeah, there's things sometimes throughout the week that, you know, maybe it's a phone call with my property manager or like a short email, but it's on average, it's a couple hours a week. And if, if there's a lot going on or it's hectic, it, it may be a couple hours a day. How, how do you, con great. how do you conceptualize that for somebody that's in the grind? Um, just, you know, just working tons of hours in the business. Um, and to get to your level of success, there's a different, there's a different mindset. There's a different way you see things um, than the individual that's working in their business 80 hours a week, because you are incredibly successful. You make great money um, and you do what you love. So there, there's obviously your other people are playing checkers. You're playing chess um, and you're being strategic with your moves. What, what do you think that is? I, I want to interrupt before you answer the question. Your, it's certainly very clear you know what you're doing and be able to own those things yourselves and be that good with creative financing. But I think we've kind of just jumped over the fact that you've been doing this for 19 years. There's something to be said about that. In 2005, you may have been working two hours a week, but that's because you couldn't find a job. <laughs> like now it's because you're choosing to, right? It's because of how much work you've put in throughout the years. It's, it's not like you're the last 19 years you've worked two hours a, a week. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah. It, I mean, it's kind of been a combination of those things, right? Because in, in those early years, I thought being busy meant productive, but I realized that like productive and busy weren't the same things. And I also, a lot of it came from just clarity on why I wanted to build wealth in the first place. And so for me, I felt this like innate desire to build wealth. Right. And, and some of it was out of necessity, like I was qualified for nothing. I don't want to have like an actual job. I don't want to answer to somebody else. I want to be my own boss. But when I reflected, I'm like, why is that important to me? Like I, I just felt this like urge and desire to be financially free and to build wealth. But when I thought about like, it, it, even in those early years, like why is this so important to me? I realized it it came down to time. I wanted to own my time. I didn't want someone telling me where to show up and when to show up. And I didn't want to punch a clock and and so even in those early years, I, I put a lot of importance on time. And some of that was because I actually wanted to spend time with my family. Like I wanted to spend time with my wife. I wanted to be a part of raising my own, my own kids. And, you know, it's so I, I very strategically built my real estate business around that. It's why I chose not to start a property management company. It's why I chose not to syndicate. Now, obviously you can build systems and put people in place to do that in those early years, I knew nothing about a team and systems and anyone I knew in property management were, you know, they were dealing with their property managers and they were busier than anybody that had a W2 job. So I made a lot of decisions early on, um, that, that didn't sacrifice my time because I realized that the whole reason I got into real estate investing in the first place wasn't just about financial freedom. It was about time freedom. Cause I wanted to do what I wanted to do when I wanted to do it. And so I made a lot of choices, like not starting a property management company, not syndicating deals. There's a lot that I say no to. And a lot of that comes from, I'm just really, really clear on the couple things that are important to me. Like my family is very important to me. My health is very important to me. My freedom is very important to me. Being able to travel and do what I want to do to, to say yes to the things that align and to say no to the things that don't, that that is so clear for me that it's a lot easier for me to go, yes, that aligns. I'm going to do it. No, that doesn't align. I'm, I'm not going to do it. And so I really built my business around that before, um, you know, it got out of hand. I've watched a lot of people build real estate businesses. They get into real estate because they say they want time freedom. They say they want financial freedom, but you dig one layer deeper. Most investors that I talk to, with, the, with a few exceptions, I do think some people love, like they'll work a hundred hours a week, no matter what. And that's their happy place. And, and that's fine. But I'd say 90 something percent of the people I talk to, the whole reason they get into real estate is because they want financial freedom because they actually want time freedom to go do something else. They get into it because they want to spend time with their family. They want to travel. They want to give back to some cause. And then they've built themselves. They left their W2, let's say that they were working for 40 hours a week 
and they got into real estate for financial freedom or truly time freedom, but now they're working 100 hours a week and they're farther away from their goal. They're working 100 hours a week and they're not spending time with their family. They're not traveling. They're not giving back to the cause. They're not doing all these things, which of why they got into real estate in the first place. So like, I love investing in real estate. I love building wealth, but I'm not gonna, I, there's a lot that I won't sacrifice to do it. And I'm fine saying no to a lot of things if it's gonna take me away from those things outside of real estate that are important to me. That's awesome, man. Amen. The, the, the power of no, the power of no. I love that. All right, brother. We're going to get to our final quick session. The final three with CNC. This is the final three questions with Chris and Colin. Um, I'll, I, I know you're, you're a man of habits. What, what are some non-negotiables you got? Got non-negotiables. Well, non-negotiable habits. Yeah. I've been strictly vegan for 20 years. Are you serious? Yes. I I have not had one bite of anything not vegan in 20 September. So 20 years. That's a non, that's a non-negotiable for me. Yeah. And for for people listening, this guy is jacked. Why? (laughs) You know, I, I read an article 20 years ago about a guy that, that I mean, this is the short story, the short answer. Uh, 20 years ago, I read an article about a guy that reversed colon cancer by going vegan. And I thought that's, that's amazing, but it's one guy in one story. And, uh, you know, the more I researched, I was just convinced it was the healthiest thing for me. Uh, you know, my dad's dad died of heart disease. My, my uncle eventually, uh, died of heart disease and so did my dad. And so, you know, to me, health is very important. I want to live as long as possible, as healthy, healthily as possible. Now, maybe that's not right for everybody. I mean, I like to say I was, uh, I've been vegan since before the liberals thought it was cool. Um, <laughs> but you know, like it, it's like everything else. Like when I read rich dad, poor dad, I'm like, everybody needs to quit their job and invest in real estate. Like, I don't think that now when I first went vegan, I'm like, everybody needs to eat this way. Like, I, I don't care if you invest in real estate and I don't care if you want to, you know, eat vegan or not, but I, I feel like I thrive on it. Like I feel good. I feel great. I feel better at 42 than I did at 20. And so, uh, for me, for me, it works. And that's, that's a non-negotiable. Do you have caffeine? I do. Okay. I'm trying to find a vice here with this guy. (laughs) I'll I'll drink caffeine. I don't drink coffee, but I, uh, I do drink all natural energizers. I I also don't do, uh, I guess non-negotiables. A lot of it's with what I put in my body. I don't, um, I don't do any artificial colors, flavors, additives, preservatives, um, none of the artificial shit. Good for you. Yeah. Uh, if you could restart as a real estate investor, knowing what you know now, what's the first thing you'd do? I probably very similar to what I, what I did. I mean, I would, I would build relationships. I would tell every single person I know what I'm looking for. I mean, I, I made business cards when I owned one property that said I was a real estate inv- investor because I believed it in my mind. And that's how I found my second deal was a guy at the gym that I was working out with. And I said, I'm investing in real estate. And that second deal was his friend's dad's rental property that was going vacant. He sold it to me in a hot market, you know, when, and, and off market. So that, that's what I would do. I would build for re- like genuine relationships and I would tell everybody what, what I'm looking to do. And I would try to put as many no money down seller finance deals that cash flow together as possible. What do you want to be? You know, it's Gabe. It's, let's see, it's the year 21, 24. You've lived till 142 years old, just passed away. Uh, What do you want to be remembered for? Gosh, I honestly don't care. (laughs) I no, I, I, I know that sounds weird, but I've, I've been asked about legacy before and I've heard a, a lot of people asked about like what they want their legacy to be. Mm-hmm. I literally don't care. Like I don't need my name on a building. I don't, I don't care what someone remembers me for because I want them to remember me for whatever they remember me for. Like if, if they felt like I was a good person, then great. If, if uh, I inspired them in some way, great, but I don't have this desire of like, I need to be remembered by <clears throat> this, this thing. Like I want my legacy or what people they I want them to remember me by whatever it is that they remember me by. Okay. Then what are the main, what are the two main, um, you're like, I hate your answer. You're like, I don't like, no, it. no, it's, no. It's very Hermosi ish. 
Uh, yeah, yeah. You're just you're <laughs> flying through the sky on this big rock, and you're all gonna die, and nobody cares. Um, so, what are the t- what are the one or two things that you lessons you want your children to learn from you forever? Hmm. Which, by the way, I would rope into legacy. Yeah. I don't give a if my name's on a building, but I do want to instill into family my children a way of thinking, a way to be a kindness, you know, something. Yeah. I, yeah, yeah. I think it's, I mean, it's, it's almost the same, the the same question. And I think it's, you know, I don't know, but I want my, I really, I want my kids to be authentic to who they are. I mean, I, I want them to be, um, I, I guess, I guess if there was something that I could leave to them, it would be to live their most authentic life. And whatever, whatever that looks like, I I want my kids to follow their passions, whether they're different from mine or not. And I want them to be true to them themselves and live an authentic, uh, authentic life. That's great. I, uh, this isn't part of the final questions, but can you imagine how difficult it would have been to eat vegan while you're down in those MREs? Oh yeah. I mean, it's, it's, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it, it, it's cross it's crossed my mind because it was like a year after I got back and I'm like, gosh, what uh what were you I eating? What I would have done. <laughs> <laughs> That's such garbage. When did you get out of the military? I right. got out in 05. So I came back from my deployment in 04 and then got completely out in 05. Awesome. awesome. Thanks for your service, man. Yeah, thanks, Gabe. Appreciate you bring, being on, man. Uh how can people get a hold of you if you would like them to get a hold of you? Uh, the best way to get a hold of me is probably through Instagram at the real Gabriel Hamill or at, or at your local vegan commune. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Dude, I will say you won't find me there. <laughs> I, I will say when I go out to dinner with this guy, the meals he gets look 10 X better than everybody else's meal. I, I, I don't know if it's his freaking smile or what he does in the background, but man, you, you have some vegan chef just like on call that puts together some fa- well, magnificent food. Especially when we were in Vegas together, like they brought me like a, that, that meal we went to, I don't I think it was the second 17. Meal. It was the 17 course meal. It was insane. I was like, like full after like three and they were like full size courses. I'm like, this is insane. Yeah. Do you get a lot of meal delivery and stuff to help you with the vegan? No. So, um, my wife is an amazing cook. My family, we raised the kids vegan. Both kids are not now. And my wife's not either. I'm like the last one, I'm like <laughs> the last man standing. Um, so I, I am spoiled that she's a great cook, but I think, I think she may secretly hate now that, that I am still vegan and, and the rest of the family's not. So yeah, we're working that out. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Awesome. Thanks, Gabe. Appreciate it, buddy. Yeah, man. Great having Absolutely. you on. Yeah, Thank thanks, man. You.